Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ginger Rogers and George Brent with Edith Fellows in She Married Her Boss. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our play tonight, She Married Her Boss, ought to interest nearly everyone who's ever been married or is planning to be married, or whoever had a boss, or whoever is a boss. And that can't leave out very many. Women in business are a very familiar part of American life, and so is the conflict between home and a career. Tonight we have a very efficient young woman in love with a very efficient gentleman who doesn't respond except in business matters. This situation occurs many times in life today when a business girl decides to make a career of love. And because our play is so characteristic of American life, perhaps it was fitting that we cast the heroine at a baseball game. I hadn't thought of Ginger Rogers as Julia Scott and she married her boss until I saw her cheering wildly for a rather dusty gentleman who had just stolen second base at the Hollywood ballpark a few days ago. At that moment, Ginger personified the typical American girl who can run an office or a household with equal efficiency, who drives a tennis ball with uncanny power, Cheers as a runner slides into second, and whose hats have uh, more humor than logic. But logic is no mystery to our typical American girl either. The logic of Aristotle and Plato, or the logic of Lux Toilet Soap. Instead of buying soap the way she buys a hat, she makes a logical deduction. She knows that Lux Toilet Soap is as fine a soap as she can buy, so she uses it. In fact, it's the American girl's enthusiasm for our product that makes these Monday evenings possible. So perhaps I'd better not say too much about our hats if, uh, if we want to keep in her good graces. But getting back to Ginger in the ball game, I talked to her about our play during the seventh inning stretch. Fortunately, she had a little time off from RKO Studio where she just finished the picture, Fifth Avenue Girl. So we made a deal right there. It was a little disconcerting as I turned away to hear her mutter something that sounded like robber. But uh, Ginger wasn't referring to me. It was just a comment on the umpire. The title of our play made George Brent hesitate about accepting the part of Richard Lenning, the boss. But that was before he'd read the script. George, it seems, was a little fed up with playing strong, silent men. When he found that the boss was not a strong, silent man at home, his hesitation vanished. He was utterly delighted with the way Ginger Rogers ordered him around. Edith Fellows, who played Annabelle in the film She Married Her Boss, produced by Columbia Pictures Corporation, has the same role in our production tonight. And now, just to prove that a business office is not entirely concerned with sales figures and inventory charts, we present our adaptation of She Married Her Boss. The curtain goes up on Act One, starring Ginger Rogers as Julia and George Brent as Richard, with Edith Fellows as Annabelle. The executive offices of Lennings, one of New York's finest and largest department stores. It's only a moderately busy day at Lennings, so that means no more than a, than a, well, a minor hurricane of activity around the office of Mr. Lenning, president and general manager. Mr. Lenning himself has not arrived yet, but somehow that doesn't seem to matter. His secretary, Julia Scott, has the situation well in hand. No, no, you needn't ship any samples. Our buyer will be in San Francisco tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Patrick and Mr. Hoyt, what seems to be the matter? Well, Miss Scott, well, Ms. what Scott, I want... I please, more... one at a time. Well, it's about Sunday's ad, Miss Scott. I need the feature spot for my department, a oh. special on men's flannel pajamas. And oh. I have some lovely new imported linens in my department. Mr. Hoyt would understand if he knew something about the importance of beautiful linens. The trouble Mr. with you, Miss Fitzpatrick, is that you know nothing about the appeal of men's pajamas. Please. <laughs> yes, please. Mr. Hoyt, you're right. We've got to move those flannels before warm weather. So you get the space. Thank you, Miss Scott. <laughs> well, of course. You may know best, Miss Scott. Thank you. Oh, that's Mr. Lenning coming in. Excuse me. On your way out, would you ask Miss Mayo to take all calls, and no one is to see Mr. Lenning except Mr. Edwards. He's expected. Oh, well, very good, Miss Scott. Good morning, Mr. Lenning. Good morning. Anything happened? Oh, a few minor matters. Two or three appointments that I took care of. Mr. Edwards will be here any minute. I'm afraid you'll have to see him yourself. 
Hello? Yes? Your sister, Mr. Lenny. Hello. Yes, Gertrude. Annabelle has cramps. Well, give her some bicarbonate. That lobster we had last night. Well, I'm poisoned, too. Doctor Will you please Sandler? talk to that cook? Miss Scott speaking. Mr. Well, you better call the doctor. No, I don't know the number, but you can Would look. Would you run up right away? Never mind. Miss oh, Scott's calling you. him. Yes, it's okay. He'll be right there. And, Gertrude, please don't disturb me again today. Bye. Miss Scott, that tie piano I sent Annabelle last Christmas, it's broken. She wants another one. I'll see to that. And here are the Edwards inventories. Oh, you got through them? Last night. And in my humble opinion, the Edwards Philadelphia store is a very good buy. I made a few notes as to what I do to some of the departments and the new stock they ought to carry. Fine, let's have them. You know what this is, Miss Scott? It's the step of a lifetime. Beginning of the Lenning chain of stores. There's nothing could give me a greater thrill. No, I suppose there isn't. Yes? Oh, Edwards, come in. Hello. Well, you look absolutely normal, Lenning. Oh, you didn't think I would? Not if you want to buy a department store. Personally, I shudder walking into one, especially my own. We'll soon fix that for you. You have that contract, Miss Scott? Right here. Scott. Uh, Julia Scott. Oh, I beg your pardon. Mr. Edwards, Miss Scott. How do you do? But uh, where's the mole? Mole? Am I supposed to have a mole? Yes, with the hair in it. Oh. That was my idea of Julia Scott. Well, I'll have to get one. Excuse me. Now, Mr. Edwards, about those inventories. Hello, Julia. Martha, what are you doing here? Waiting to take you to lunch. Now, Martha. Toy department, please. And I don't want your usual answer about being too busy. Let Lennings run itself for an hour. You sure Reynolds didn't send you over here to see how a real department store is run? Mm. We've got nothing to learn. Hello? Toy department? A mechanical toy piano to Mr. Lenning's home right away. Well, then get one. It's for Annabelle Lenning. <laughs> Martha, I'm not at all sure I can go. After all, I've got so oh, many... Oh, Miss Scott. Yes, Mr. Edwards. Look, uh, with or without a mole, I'll take you to lunch. <laughs> Well, will you? Sorry, but I have a date right here. Miss Pryor, Mr. Edwards. Miss Pryor's head buyer at Reynolds. Oh, hello. Hello. Let's go, Martha. Sorry, Mr. Reynolds, some other time. Oh, wait, look, I'll take both of you to lunch. Oh, no. No, you couldn't stand Martha, Mr. Edwards. I think she's got a mole. <laughs> And there it is, Julia, my pet. Reynolds wants a manager for our San Francisco office. He wants the best department store executive he can find. Well, you're it. Says you. Says Reynolds. Says everybody. He told me to go out and get you. Eat faster, Martha. I've got to get back. Oh, a real job, paying twice what you're getting now. What do you say? Declined with thanks. Why? Well, I'm happy where I am. Oh, I knew you had it bad, Julia. It's been obvious to a child you're in love with Richard Lenning. But when you throw over a job like this to slave for that imitation of a man, it's alarming. I dare you to say it isn't so. Well, what if it is? It's hopeless. Oh, you're a cheerful little girl. To begin with, a man's a confirmed woman hater. He's not. He's, he's just forgotten about women. Oh, humbug. That's the one thing a man doesn't forget. Oh, yes, he could, Martha. When a wife has given him a bad deal and divorced him without any reason, when he's buried himself in business just to forget the things that hurt him. <sighs> Very touching. Well, what's the cure? You haven't found it in six years. But when I do, he'll pay up for those six years, Martha. He'll pay back like an angel. Oh, moonbeams. In the first place, what do you know about this graven image called Lenny? Ever been in his home? No, but I... Mm hmm Well, what's it like? Could you live there? Why don't you find out? And incidentally, maybe you'd find out he was a man instead of that plaster saint you're swooning about up in that office. You might discover a way to tackle the gent... Julia, have you heard a word I said? Mm, yes, vaguely. And you know, I've been thinking. Thinking? Yes, it's too bad that you can't mind your own business. Now, uh, let's see. The Edwards China Department has got your note says... Pretty that... junky stock. Chuck it all and install the line we carry here. Hello? Gertrude, oh, this is the ninth time this afternoon. Yes, I know it's late, but I'm busy. Well, what if they are annoyed? Are we working for the butler and cook, or are they working for us? All right, right away. Sorry, I've got to quit. Well, why not work tonight? Well, I hate to impose on you. Oh, that's you. all right. Well, then suppose I meet you back here at the office at about... Oh, no, no, it can't, it can't be here. The cooling system went haywire today. There's gas escaping. Oh, uh -huh. well, that's that. Let's um, uh, work at your home, huh? My home? That's uh -huh. a madhouse. Well, it's better than nothing. Shall I meet you there after dinner, or shall we go right now? Uh huh? Well, right now. Get your hat and coat and call the car. Oh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Richard, here you are at last. Oh, 
Good evening, Miss Lenny. Oh, that's right. Mm-hmm. You know my sister, don't yes. you? Mm-hmm. Gertrude, Miss Scott's having dinner with us. We'll have some work to do later on. I tell you, I won't! I want to see my daddy! Daddy! Your bathrobe, Miss Annabelle. Put it on, please, for me. Daddy! Hello, darling. <laughs> I thought you were sick in bed. Well, where is it? Darling, give Daddy a big hug. Where is what I asked for? Here it is, Annabelle. Give it to me. Miss Annabelle, you mustn't sit on the cold floor. I thought you were sick. The doctor said you was lying again. There was nothing wrong with her. This is a piano. I said I wanted a music box. Now, Lammy Pie, you said you wanted a piano. That's what I am. I said about. a music box. You, you're supposed to be my father's secretary. Can't you get things straight? Annabelle. Why, Lammy Pie. <clears throat> Dinner is served. All right, come on. I've got a few things I'd like to have understood around. And something will have to be done about those calls during business hours, Gertrude. There are always emergencies, Richard. And most of them brought on by that child. Aunt Gertrude loves to tattle, especially on me. Well, tattling is better than incurable lying. Please, please, I'm speaking about other things. Water heaters bursting, accounts running low. Such things can't be avoided in the running of a house. Not unless it's run on a very strict business system. A home, Miss Scott, is not a place of business. I beg your pardon, sir. Yes, Russell, what now? Well, sir... About that water heater, it might not have exploded if somebody hadn't fooled with the valve. Well, who did? Well, I couldn't say, sir. But I did see Miss Annabelle go down in the basement this afternoon. I did not. That old butler just doesn't like me. Annabelle, why did you go down in the basement this afternoon? I, uh, I saw a man go down there. He looked like a burglar. There you are. A fine example of her lying. Like mother, like daughter, I always say. Gertrude, I've asked you never to make that reference again. Oh, this food. What is it? What is it? What is it? Maybe it's cat. Annabelle. Well, I did see Mrs. Russell cutting up something funny. It's roast beef. Well, it's the wrong part of the cow. Roast leather. I thought you were going to speak to the cook. Well, I... I hinted very broadly. Hinted? Oh, please, Richard, be tactful. Do you want the servants to think we're barbarians? Why not? They feed us that way. Miss Scott is right. This place won't be livable until a system is installed. Then why not install one, Mr. Lenning? Yes, but how? Oh, if I can only spare you from the office for about a week. I wouldn't need a week. A couple of hours would do if you could give me complete authority. All right, you've got it. All right, fine. Russell, Russell, you're just in time. Never mind the dessert. No one's eating anyhow. I want to see you in the library immediately. And your wife. And the governess and the handyman. Get them at once. Now, just a moment. Russell, you heard me. They've been lost, Miss. Oh, so they've been lost. Half of the meat and grocery bills have just disappeared. Well, then perhaps you can explain, Russell, why the cost of food coming into this house has doubled, while the quality has gone down until it's not fit to eat. If the young lady knew anything about conditions... I know all about conditions. Russell, it's obvious that both you and your wife are not only incompetent, but dishonest as well. You're fired. Get out of the house tonight. Very well. Come on, Sarah. Richard, I'll not have the Lenning home invaded like this by a common secretary. Sit down, Miss Lenning. Do what she says, Gertrude. I'll give her full authority. Daddy? You too, Annabelle. Keep quiet. Now, let's see. You... Over there, you're the handyman, aren't you? Yet I find that in the four months you've been here... Excuse me, miss. I'm quitting. And now the governess. I am sure I have done my best, mademoiselle. I have been so patient and kind. But Annabelle needs someone with brass knuckles. And who knows how to use them? I'll see that you find a job more suitable to your talents. Thank you, mademoiselle. The very idea. Richard... You know how hard it is to find a suitable governess. That was the point. She wasn't suitable. And Annabelle. What about Annabelle? Yeah, what about me? Well, Annabelle is going to take care of herself and grow into a fine, self-reliant young lady. And the first thing she's going to do is go to bed right now. No, I'm not. And I don't like you. You're going to bed and this minute. Stay away from me. Daddy! Come on. Up those stairs. I won't. I won't. And you're a mean, nasty, ugly little thing. I I hate you. (laughs) There. Annabelle, go up those stairs at once. I won't, and it won't do you any good to make me because I won't sleep, so there. Oh, yes, you will, oh, because no. I'm going to give you oh, something no, no, to make you sleep. Stay away from me. Come here, Lassie. Oh, <laughs> <Daddy, you laughs> this Daddy, is marvelous. Why didn't I think of this before? And this, well, you... You know this part of the store, Mr. Edwards? Exactly. The executive officer. <laughs> private sanctuaries of King Lenning and his prime ministress, Julia Scott. <laughs> You're a madman. Not at all. How could any man resist Lenning's offer after you had just conducted him personally through each of its smoothly functioning departments? In fact, I suddenly find I have a soft spot in my heart for department stores. You mean you'll stay on as manager of the store we're buying from you? I shall. And do you know why? Because of you. Oh. Tell me... Uh, don't you suppose that if I do a bad enough job as manager, Lenning will send you down to Philadelphia to uh, 
check up on me? Well, I'm sure I don't know. Well, a man can always hope. And you can count on me to do my level worst. <laughs> Farewell, fair damsel. <laughs> Until Philadelphia. <laughs> Hey, Miss oh, Scott, dear. is that guy cracked? I don't know, Agnes. Sometimes I wonder myself. Is Mr. Lenning back yet? About ten minutes ago. And Miss Pryor was waiting for him. She's in there now. Pryor? Oh, Martha Pryor? What did she want to see him about? Well, she only said it was personal and important. Oh, personal and important, huh? Uh, Mr. Lenning, Mr. Edwards wanted me to tell you... Oh, Martha. I'm sorry I didn't realize you had an appointment with Mr. Lenning. I wouldn't have... Fun. <laughs> I didn't. Well, I guess that's all, Mr. Lenning. I'll be getting back to Reynolds. Well, thanks for, for telling me about this, Miss Pryor. Uh, not at all. Oh, by the way, Julia, are you and Harry leaving town this weekend, or shall I be seeing you two lovebirds? Harry? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, what? Oh, yes, you'll be seeing me. Well, that'll be lovely, won't it? Goodbye. Miss Scott, please sit down. All right. Now, why didn't you tell me you were leaving? Leaving? Yes. Surely after our long association, I shouldn't have to learn such information from an outsider. But I... Oh. Yeah, now, now, look here, Miss Scott. Uh, Julia. Uh, surely we've worked together long enough for me to call you Julia. Of course, Mr. Lenning. Uh, Richard. Uh, Richard. Well, uh, all right. Yeah. Richard. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, uh, Julia, I, uh, I may never have taken the trouble to say so, but you're indispensable to me. Thank you. Yes. But now Miss Pryor tells me you plan to leave on a week's notice. She did? Yes. Why? What well, does this fellow Reynolds have to offer that I can't top? Well, a uh, uh, manager of his San Francisco office. Oh, yes? Well, mm -hmm. you're general manager of Lennings beginning today, and you can write your own salary ticket. Oh, but, but it, well, it wasn't just the managership or the salary, but it, I was thinking of, well, myself. You mean uh, just yourself? You? Mm-hmm. Oh. Me. That is, in relation to things in general, such as, well, marriage, for one thing. Marriage? Mm hmm Oh, Oh, well, may I just ask who this uh, Harry is? Harry? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Pryor. Oh, oh, him. I mean, that Harry. Yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, yeah. Tell me, uh, is, uh, well, uh, I mean, is he... Is he uh, serious? Uh -huh. Yeah. No, no, he's very nice, but, but, well, to be frank, you do want me to be frank, don't you? Oh, yeah, oh certainly. Yeah. Well, it's not easy for me to become interested in men because I'm afraid I demand more than I'll ever find. Such as what? Well, some sort of common interest. Well, if there's nothing more, I... Uh, uh, Julia, uh, Julia. Yes? Uh, you really must go to San Francisco? Well, yes. Well, you can't. Richard... I need you, and the store needs you. Now, Julia, uh, let's uh, be practical about this. Oh, yes. Now, we must be practical. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you you, uh, you said a moment ago that, well, that you were, uh, what you demand in a man was mutual interest. Yes, but... Now, you, that, 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 that's sensible. <laughs> because you're an intelligent woman, you'd never accept less than that, than no, that in marriage. No, no. And you're old enough and wise enough to have outgrown all the nonsense and love and so-called pure romance. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, peculiarly enough, the same is true of me. You know, Julia, I never made a point of discussing it. But I arrived at my present point of intelligence about such things through one very bitter experience. I made the mistake of letting my heart rule my head. <laughs> well, I shall never make that mistake again. Naturally, I, I understand. Of course you I... do. Of course you understand. And, Julia, the, uh, the partnership we've known in this office... The uh, dependence on each other has been, uh, well, has been a marriage in a sense, hasn't it? I mean, yes, uh, well, the, the most perfect kind. Of, yes, Richard. Uh, uh, well, Julia, what I'm trying to say is this, that uh, don't you think that uh, you and I sort of, without any fuss or excitement about it, could, uh, well, we could uh, sort of get a plane and, and, and uh, yeah, sort of fly yeah, over yeah. to... Uh, yes, I believe you, we you, could, you, you Richard. Do, you, 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 oh. Hello. Is that you, Gertrude? Richard, where on earth are you? Dinner's been ready for hours, and Annabelle's having tantrums. Well, Gertrude, listen, I'm over in Marysville. Julia and I flew over here this afternoon and got married. Marysville? Well, what on earth are... Married? Yes, Gertrude. Married? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Ger Gertrude? Uh, Gertrude? Hello? Uh, uh, uh... That was act one of She Married Her Boss. Just how big a surprise the new bride is to the boss's family will be evident at act two, which we hear in a moment. Right now, Mr. Ruick, our genial commentator on domestic matters, has something to tell the ladies about 
one way of being boss in the family. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. In the few moments before Ginger Rogers, George Brent, and Edith Fellows return and she married her boss, I want to tell the women in our audience how to be boss and yet make the men like it. What I mean is this. If you're really charming, attractive, you'll find that it's much easier to keep the household running smoothly. Strange though it may be, when you look your best, those around you seem to like you a lot more. Actually, want to do what you want them to do. I suppose, Mr. Ruick, you mean that the smart girl will really be concerned about the condition of her skin and use Lux toilet soap pretty faithfully. Yes, that's exactly what I do mean. And there's another way of making yourself attractive to those around you. Being very careful to protect your feminine daintiness. You mean to use your complexion soap, Lux toilet soap, as a bath soap, too? That's it, Mr. Ruick. Because Lux has active lather that leaves skin really fresh. And an exquisite perfume that leaves skin sweet. And people can't resist a girl who's sweet, Mr. Roy. We have a song to sing about that. Well, fine, let's hear it. Stay as sweet as you are, discreet as you are, you divine dear. Stay as grand as you are, and as you are, tell me that you're mine, dear. Young and gay, old, old and gray. Near to me or afar, night and day I pray that you'll always stay. Stay as sweet as you are. Mm, that was sweet. It calls for an encore. All right, we'll make it short and to the point. Use Lux soap every day. It's the easy way if you want to stay. Sweet as you are. Our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with Act Two of She Married Her Boss, starring Ginger Rogers as Julia, George Brent as Richard, with Edith Fellows as Annabelle. <laughs> it's late the same evening. Back from their flying trip to Marysville have come Richard and Julia. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Lenning. As the latest addition to the Lenning family, anything but an enthusiastic reception awaits Julia. Only the butler is on hand to greet the newlyweds as they stand on the threshold of the Lenning mansion. Congratulations, Mr. Lenning and Mrs. Lenning. Oh, thank you. Uh, who are you? Uh, the new butler, sir, Franklin. Mrs. Lenning's things are all here and put away, sir. Oh, fine, fine. Oh, Julia, come on. What's the matter? Matter? Yes, what are you standing there outside the door for? Richard, a bride is always carried over the threshold of a new home. She's what? Carried. Oh, oh now, Julia, be reasonable. <laughs> this is no hour for sentimental nonsense. I wouldn't insist, Richard, but it's always done. Oh, but it's... Uh, oh, well, all right. Franklin, give me a hand, will you? Oh, Richard... <laughs> Come on, a seat with our hands. Yeah, that's nice. Nice time of the night for a circus act. There, will that do? That's all, Richard. Thank uh, you. Well, I'm glad of that. Boy, am I tired and the whole day wasted. What do you mean, wasted? Well, no work done. By the way, Franklin, did some papers come out to me from the office? Yes, sir, this afternoon. Good, that'll be the Edwards contract. Could have it all checked over by morning. Oh, Richard, it's so late. Can't you let it go till tomorrow? Nonsense. I told him I'd sign it at 11. Would it matter so very much if it were delayed a day? Why, Julia, I thought you realized what this deal means to me. It's the beginning of the Lenning chain of stores. You just give me three years and I'll have a string of Lennings all over the Atlantic coast. Say, I've got an idea. We'll get a map with colored pins. Red for the Philadelphia store, blue for New York, green for the... Uh, 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 Julia, is, uh, is there anything wrong? No, of course not, Richard. I'm just going upstairs. Oh, oh, all right. Good night. Good night. Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Nothing, Richard. Good night. Uh-huh. Take it away! Take it away! Take it away! I told you I don't want any breakfast. But, Miss Annabelle, you must eat breakfast. I'm not going to eat breakfast or lunch or dinner or anything as long as somebody is in this house. Good morning, Annabelle. Morning, Franklin. Uh, good morning, sir. Well, what's this, Annabelle? You playing the part of a sphinx this morning or not feeling so chipper? I think from the size of that breakfast, you felt rather good. It appears that Miss Annabelle is not eating that breakfast, sir. It is, if I may say so, purely for psychological reasons. Oh, effect. Annabelle, what is this foolishness? Explain yourself. Oh, good morning, Gertrude. 
Ah, well, a cheery little soul. Let's open a mortuary around here. Franklin, bring me black coffee. Nothing more. Oh, shake hands with Annabelle. She's hunger striking, too. I don't wonder. As for me, I'm all packed. I shall be out of the house by noon. Oh, you're being absurd, both of you. I suppose all this ridiculous behavior is due to my, uh, well, uh, my adventure in matrimony yesterday. Now, of course, it met with your unqualified disfavor, Gertrude. I don't like her either. That's half out of you. Gertrude, I've already explained to you the whys and the wherefores of this marriage. Oh, don't trouble again. After all, I'm only a blood relation and one person sincerely concerned for your future. It doesn't matter that I remember where your reckless impulsiveness led you reckless, once before. Reckless, impulsive, just... <laughs> Just because I marry an intelligent business partner, a partner whose duties are now enlarged to include the management of a home. Sensible. Don't you think I saw a certain party being carried over the threshold in the middle of the night? Like a blushing bride. Oh, well, now, morning. Gertrude, all of us have whims. I'm... Good morning, <coughs> my family. Uh, good morning to good, you. Good morning, good morning, Good morning. Julia. Good morning, Gertrude. Good morning. <clears throat> a very good morning. How about you, Annabelle? Are you and Gertrude both out of sorts? Uh, well, the atmosphere does seem a little charged this morning, Julia, for which I apologize. So I see. Gertrude reduced to black coffee and Annabelle hunger striking in grand style. Now look here, Annabelle. You stop this nonsense and say a civil good morning. Well, that's all right, Richard. She'll talk to me in a due course of things. I won't ever talk to you. You just did. Huh. How about the contract, Richard? Did you finish checking it last night? Completely. And in about two more hours, we'll own the... Why, Julia, <laughs> well, you're not dressed. You... Well, you can't wear that dress to the office. I'm not going to the office. You know, listen, there's a whole day's work piled up down there. There's about ten years' work piled up around here. Oh, but Julia, Agnes can't begin to handle the details. She, she... never will until she finds she has to. Oh, well, i got to go now. You know, this is nonsense, Julia. You can't waste your time fooling around the house. In two hours, you'll be bored to death and come running back to work. Will I? We'll see, Richard. Goodbye, dear. Uh, I'll call you later. Mmm. Oatmeal's delicious. Try some. No. I think you'd better. I said no. Didn't you hear me? Annabelle, I wonder if you remember the spanking I gave you the other night. All right, spank me again. Beat me! I don't care. You can eat a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I mean, eat. Well, I won't eat a smidge while you're in this house. Mm, that might be a long time. Well, I can hate for a long time. An awful long time. Annabelle, I'm interested. Why do you hate me? What for did you want to go and marry my father? I love him. Well, he don't love you. No? No, nobody could. You're a nuggly, nasty old thing, and I, I don't want you for a mother. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear that, because I certainly don't want anybody who's stupid for a daughter. I'm not stupid. I'm smart. Smart? Why, you can't even make up an interesting lie. I saw the cook cutting up something funny. Maybe it's cat. And I saw a tough-looking man going down to the cellar. Well, I could do better than that with using only half my brain. I wasn't using any brain, so there. Uh-huh. Huh. You, you think you're smart, don't you? Much smarter than you, and I can prove it. Listen, two little rabbits named Christopher and Gwendolyn went into the woods one day and had a whole bunch of very interesting experiences. Now, if you and I were both to think about that, I'll bet I could tell a much better story than you. Smarty, you already know the answer. No, I don't. But just to make it harder, I may even write mine like a poem with rhymes and everything. And when I finish, why, then you'll realize what a really stupid little girl you are. I'm going now. I'll have Franklin take your breakfast to your room just in case you want to smell it. I've got a cold, so there. And you can take the food, because I won't eat it. All right. I only hope you won't find it too hard to think on an empty stomach. The 34 sales on shoes, Miss Mayo. I tell you, we've got to have it. Well, I'm looking for it, Mr. Lenning, but nobody but Miss Knott knows where those things are. Well, Mr. Lenning, about that special sale... Just a moment, Mr. Hoyt. I think my problem no, is a little please. more important, Mr. Please. Lenning. Please. Well, somebody shut that door. Now, what is it? Well, this my department will have to know where to go Lenning. ahead please, with this. Please, please. Hello. Don't bother me. Agnes, can't you take some of those calls? I'm sorry, sir, but Miss Scott didn't Miss tell Scott, me. Miss Scott, Miss Scott, will you stop talking about Miss Scott? I told you an hour ago to get her on the telephone. Tell her I said she's got to come down here. Now. Gertrude, may I come in? Of course. Is your house now... Oh, please, don't just walk out on me. It's very important. Well? First of all, I know you won't believe it, but I love your brother. I've loved him for six years. I know what his life has been. And loving him, I want to help him find happiness again. I want him to know for the first time what a real home can mean. I want mostly for his sake for him to recover some normal instincts. Towards you, you hope. Towards any woman. And why not me? Oh, can't you see? With your help, I could... Pardon me, Mrs. Lenning, but it's a story again on the telephone. 
Oh, tell them I'm indisposed. But they said it was important. Uh, what shall I say, ma'am? Tell them I took poison. Tell them anything you want, but I'm not going down there. Yes, ma'am. Some more of your great consideration for my brother. Yes, it is. He can get along without me at the store. It means inconvenience and readjustment, but he can do it. Where I'm really needed is here. Oh. Oh, Gertrude, now don't freeze up on me. I need your help. I'm asking for it. If from now on we could just work together on this thing. For instance, Annabelle... My I... niece is not a department of the store, Miss Scott. I'm afraid you can't take an inventory and then reorganize her. But we can. At least I want to try to. Look, Gertrude, you've seen more of her than anyone else. Tell me about her. What are her interests? What does she like to do? What does she Miss like... Scott, Annabelle's interests are no concern of yours. And the less you have to do with her, or with me, the better I like it. All right. I should have known better than to expect your understanding or your help. You're a bitter, frustrated old maid, Gertrude Lenning, and the natural enemy of every woman who loves and wants to be loved by a man. You're going to take out your bitterness on the entire feminine world as long as you live, even if it costs your brother's happiness to do it. job, Richard, and I'll need your advice. I know, I know, but the important thing is that I need you at the office. Julia, you have no idea. Mail, files, appointments, everything in the mess. Then hire somebody who can straighten them out. You haven't answered my question about Annabelle. Oh, good Lord, how do I know what a child's interests are? A lot of impossible things. Going to public school, wanting roller skates so that she can stay with anybody and everybody on the street, and insisting on going to those serial movies every Saturday afternoon. I don't know what she... Are those things impossible? You wouldn't give your permission. Of course not. A child of Annabelle's background? Richard, the trouble with Annabelle's background is that it's flat and deadly and unbearably dull. The child wants a little adventure. And what does she get? A new batch of toys from the store. Now, Julia, please don't complicate. Complicate? Look, am I in charge of this home or not? Yes, but... All right, then. Just leave Annabelle to me. All right, but Julia, for heaven's sake, forget this nonsense. Get it out of your system and come back to work. never attended public school before? No, she's always had tutors. I don't know just what grade she's really eligible for. I ought to be the fifth grade. We'll soon find that out, Mrs. Lenny. Come, Annabelle. Hey, whoa! Whoa, let's rest a minute. I'm done in. Well, all I can say is oh. you certainly look like 14 kinds of a soup <sighs> on roller skates at your age. Just the same, I beat you. Well, you ought to. You're older, aren't you? Now, that's what I call a swell movie. Well, every man to his own opinion. Bet you that G-man gets out of the burning house next week. You know, generally speaking, I think that's a pretty good bet. <laughs> and don't think I haven't watched you. For weeks you've been indulging the child in all sorts of vulgarity, making a spectacle of yourself skating on the streets, trying to bribe her into accepting... That's her. not true. Maybe you call it indulging Annabelle to let her live a normal life for her years, but I don't. Oh, you're quite concerned about normal lives, aren't you? I've seen from the first what you've tried to do. You thought you'd bring Richard around by making a fuss over his daughter. <gasps> Gertrude, you'd better stop. I want to keep my temper with you, but I don't, don't see... Don't bother. And just in case you're interested in how your little plan has worked... Annabelle told me yesterday that she hates you. She hates you just as much now as the first day you came in this house. That's a lie, Julia. I never said that. Annabelle, what were you doing behind that curtain? Were you listening? What do you think? That I'm a stool pigeon or something? I was on the window seat writing something when you came in, and, and Aunt Gertrude lied. I never said I hated you. I'm glad, Annabelle. Well, hmm, that doesn't mean I love you either. Well, you can feel, well, sort of neutral about someone, can't you? Yes, Annabelle, you can. And you Lennings are swell at that. Um, what you crying about? I'm not crying. Oh, I suppose that's rain or something rolling down the side of your nose. And you said I was a bum liar. <laughs> did, did I? Sure. Remember you said I couldn't make up a rhyme about some rabbits named Gwendolyn and Christopher? Well, listen to this. Christopher and Gwendolyn went walking one day, and they met a bear in the woods far away. He ate them both with a knife and fork, and that was the end of the rabbit's walk. There. Hmm, not bad. A little gory, but good. You certainly got rid of them fast, didn't you? Oh, I'll get them out of it in the next episode, but I'm busy with the music now. Oh, there's music, too. Sure, I made it up on my piano. Listen. Christopher and Gwendolyn went walking one day, and they met a bear in the woods far away. Oh, from then on, I'm stuck. <laughs> Bravo! Bravissimo! Well, Mr. Edwards... Don't mind me. Go right on with the opera. Uh, Annabelle, this is Mr. Edwards, the man your daddy bought the Philadelphia store from. Mr. Lenning's daughter. Hello. Charm, my fair lady. 
Does Richard know you're here? I thought you were supposed to be managing the Philadelphia Emporium Deluxe. Yes, but it seems as I anticipated that I'm definitely ungood as a department store manager. The situation in dear old Philadelphia is completely blotto. Hence, Lafayette, I am here. <laughs> Don't mind the gentleman, Annabelle. I think he's a little cracked. You're telling me. <laughs> oh, you're both too kind. Oh, Julia, it's like this. Mm -hmm. Richard Fields, the store down there, needs reorganization. Here's a report of condition that Jessup made up. You're supposed to read it and then tell me how to start changing things. But why didn't Richard telephone me? Said you'd refuse. Oh. If I came, he knew you couldn't resist my charms. Or can you? <laughs> oh, all right. Give me the report. I want to finish our song. A great idea. You run along and read that, Juliet. Little Miss uh, Saucy Pants and I will do some composing. <laughs> all right. Now, let's see those words. Uh, here, and the music's supposed to go like this. <laughs> Walking up a hill, they walk and walk and walk and walk. In fact, they're walking still. I don't want to go to bed. I'm having too much fun. Oh, Jerry, that's keen. How was it, Julia? A little more humane. But now we'd better get down to business. I finished this report, Mr. Edwards, and uh, I find it... Uncle Jerry. Yes, Uncle Jerry. And the first thing you've got to do down there is to reorganize the advertising staff. I find oh, it... Oh, yes. Uh... And another thing, your window displays, they've got to be made much oh, more attractive. Wait a minute, Annabelle, another verse. Listen. Listen, Jerry, if Richard wants us to straighten out oh, the store business, we've got to get... Oh, but that's not as important as a new verse for Gwendolyn, is it, but, Annabelle? Uh, no. You see? Listen. <laughs> they saw some snails with great big horns and bonnets on their heads. They lived in shells, and in their shells, they slept in feather beds. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, all together. <laughs> they, they saw, saw some shells with great big horns and bonnets on their heads. <laughs> they lived in shells, and in their shells, they slept in feather beds. I don't want to go to bed. I'm having too much fun. That's very well. Julia. What's it? Oh. Oh, hello, Richard. Uh, do you suppose he doesn't like music? Gosh, he looked mad. I had better go see. You two go ahead. Hello, Richard. Richard. You look terribly annoyed, darling. I sent Edwards here because the Philadelphia store is in a mess. I wanted you to give him advice, and how do you give it to him? By sitting on the floor singing a lot of nonsense. Some high spirits that needed blowing off, that's all. And as for the store report, no, I've read it and I... not just this, Julia. It's everything these last weeks. You've changed. You were someone I thought I could count on, and instead of helping me, you let me down completely. I might almost say criminally. In other words, I haven't lived up to our marriage bargain, is that it? Well, you don't need to put it exactly that way. Why not? Richard, you say I've changed. I have. It happened the moment I stepped foot in this house as your wife. It was home here, and I loved it. I was a woman, a woman for the first time, and I loved that too. In other words, by marrying you, I lost a valuable partner and acquired a woman. Someone who would blithely wreck my business while sitting home singing nonsense in the living room with a man. Oh, Richard, you sound jealous. I am not. I told you once that that part of my life is completely dead. With it went all interest in women, as you're trying to be a woman. And furthermore, if you want the truth, it doesn't become you. You're no longer the Julia Scott I can admire. This change has made you ludicrous, if not downright pathetic. Thanks. I was curious about how you really saw me. Oh, now, Julia, I mean... You're right, Richard. Perfectly right. I did let you down. I didn't live up to our bargain at all, so I'm going to do something about it. Now, Julia, I don't mean turning around and going to extremes, but you could help a little right now, for instance... For instance, go down and take charge in Philadelphia. Get the store there up to the famous Lenning standard of efficiency. Is that it? Well, yes, Julia, if you could. Oh, I could, Richard. And I shall. You can depend on me. Oh, that's fine, fine. I know you understand, and it shouldn't take long. That's where you're wrong, Richard. You have no idea how long it may take. In fact, I wouldn't be at all surprised if I never got back from Philadelphia. <laughs> Curtain Falls on Act Two of our play. Is the boss's wife needed more at home or in the office? You'll find that out in the third act, which follows a short intermission. In the meantime, a faithful friend of the Lux Radio Theater answers some other questions. In our brief intermission before Act Three of She Married Her Boss, starring Ginger Rogers, George Brent, and Edith Fellows, I want to remind the ladies in our audience that Lux Toilet Soap isn't only as fine a complexion soap as money can buy. Every day, more women are discovering that this white, delicately perfumed soap makes a wonderful bath soap, too. I just adore my Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath. It's so sort of luxurious and relaxing. 
and such a protection. This lather is active, you know, and carries away perspiration and every trace of dust and dirt. I'm in a hurry to keep my date, but I wouldn't take chances with daintiness for anything in the world. That's the voice of one of those clever, up-to-date women who depend on a daily Lux soap bath to protect their feminine charm. She's the kind of girl that, well, let's have a look at her later the same evening. She's dancing now, and Bill says, Gee, Betty, you're gorgeous. Your skin is fragrant, so sweet. A Lux soap beauty bath does leave skin sweet, delicately fragrant, attractive. You know, the perfume of Lux toilet soap is not an ordinary perfume. It's a skillful blend of 34 costly ingredients. So you see, in every way, Lux soap is a splendid product. Next time you unwrap a smooth, fragrant cake of Lux soap, see how exquisite it looks, how luxurious it feels. It's as fine a soap as money can buy. Then use it for a daily bath that will refresh and relax you and assure you of daintiness, of skin that's sweet. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Once again, our play, the third act of She Married Her Boss. Three weeks have passed. Julia, true to her word, has taken charge of the Lenning store in Philadelphia. Again, she's the Julia Scott of old, machine-like in her tireless efficiency. But at the Lenning home in New York, the efficient machine is sorely missed, especially by Richard. But why? Why should dinner be late? It was never late, well, before. You mean when Julia was here? Why don't you say it? Well, it's true. It's not only the meals, it's everything else. This house was fit to live in when she was here. She's indispensable here, just as she is every place else. Daddy, when is Julia coming back? How do I know? When she finishes her job. Well, I want her back. Well, so do I. Well, as um, as a matter of fact, well, so do I. Why, Gertrude? The house does need it. I've been wrong about a few things in my life, and, well, Julia is one of them. And when I see her again, I'm, well, I'm going to tell her so. Me too. I love Julia. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. And so do you, Daddy. And Gertrude, Daddy loves Julia. Uh, <clears throat> Annabelle, you'd better go and wash for dinner. Daddy loves Julia. Annabelle, do as you're told. Daddy loves Julia. Daddy loves Julia. Daddy loves Julia. Well, uh, Gertrude, what are you looking at? Hello? Mr. Richard Lenning, please. Speaking. On your call to Philadelphia, sir. We have your party. Hello? Hello, Julia. How are you? Hello, Richard. At the office. Oh, at this hour? Well, now, Julia, there's no need to kill yourself, you know. But I wanted to tell you, I read the report you sent up this morning. You're doing a great job down there. Thank you. Um, how much longer do you think it will take you? Not long. I'm oh. practically through now. Good. I want you back here. Yeah, back home. You know, this place needs attention. Didn't that occur to you all these weeks? Surely you could have found a free evening or part of a weekend to run up here and straighten the place out. Why, you know... Wait a minute, Richard. I see what you mean. And if that private madhouse you call a home is in a turmoil again, it can stay that way. What are you talking about? I'm not coming back. What? I've fulfilled my part of the bargain. I'm delivering the Edwards store to you in perfect order, and that's all I owe you. But Julia, you can't. I mean, the house here... Forget is... a housekeeper. Oh, this is nonsense. I won't stand for it. Try and stop me. Well, where are you going? Where am I going? I can't use that kind of language on the telephone. Hooray! Jerry, you didn't hear you... I think anybody within eight blocks of here would have heard. Oh. And again, I say hooray. Jerry, how long would you say you've been waiting for me to go places with you? I make it about three weeks, no? Well, Jerry, my boy, your patience is rewarded. For tonight, we step. What's happened? Ask me no questions. Just show little Julia the bright lights. I want to find the quickest way to catch up six long years. A cinch, madame. That calls for a nice, quiet dinner. Oh, no, 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 no. That's too private, much too private. I've got it. Let's have dinner in the store. But the cafeteria's closed. But the display window isn't. Haven't you seen the new dining room display? Come on. Here 
Yeah, Mrs. Lenning. Restaurant fella says you're fond. Oh, today. good, good. Put the tray right down here on the table. Huh? I mean, you ain't really going to eat here in the store window with all them dummies. Uh, that is Why, John, those aren't dummies. They're Mrs. Lenning's family. She told me so. Mm-hmm. Huh? Look, John, what's your salary as night watchman? Why, uh, 18 a week, but I... Beginning uh... tomorrow, it's 30. Now draw that curtain across the window there to keep out the gaze of the passers-by and go on punching your clock. But now... Ma... 30 a week, John, remember? But where did I tell Martha that I saw Mrs. Lenning and Mr. Edwards in the star window with a bunch of dummies? <laughs> She'll think I'm drunk. Again. <laughs> ah, alone at last. Alone? You forget my family. Mr. Edwards, may I first present you to Grandma? Oh. On the surface, a nice old lady. Inside... Sawdust. <laughs> Howdy, ma'am. Right pleased to meet you. Oh, don't mind her not answering. A closed mouth bunch, my family. Oh. And there's Dad. That frown on his face is permanent. The old boy soured on life. Must run a department store. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> and there's Mother. Dear old Mother. A tragic figure, Mr. Edwards. She's loved Dad for years and years, but he's never responded. <laughs> Unbelievable. Hello, Ma. Oh, I almost forgot my brother Willie. <laughs> it's homework he's doing there. He's trying to prove that two and two make four. He's been at it for years. <laughs> He'll never make it. <laughs> Greetings, Willie, my lad. Well, that's my family. Let's eat. You're uh, sure they don't mind my intrusion? Mind? Oh, they're delighted. Because I'm going away tonight. This is little Julia's farewell party, and are they glad to get rid of me? Aren't you, Dad? <gasps> oh, Jerry. Jerry, look, I'm not dead. Oh, <laughs> oh, quit it, Julia. You're not fooling anybody. Talking to a lot of dummies and trying to pretend it's fun. Well, let's get out of here. Oh, don't be silly. I'm having a swell time. You're miserable. Look, Julia, forget that Lenning guy, will you? You've got some happiness coming, and I can give it to you. Can you, Jerry? You say you've lost six years. Well, you're going to get them back. Am I? Julia, look at me. Well? I've wanted to kiss you for longer than I can remember. Now I'm going to. No, no, Jerry. Julia. I know, but never mind. Never mind. You can't go. I tell you. Oh, that... Swell. Thank you. Here, here. You can't take no pictures here. Jerry, who is this woman? Good evening, Jerry. Helen. Say, say, Mr. Edwards, this lady and gentleman here said you expected them. They didn't say nothing about taking no flashlight pictures. It's all right, John. Hello, Helen. Nice of you to drop in. Wasn't it? Oh, and if you and Mrs. Lenning are interested in that picture, Jerry, I'm sure it'll be in the morning papers on the front page. Thanks. Oh, by the way, Julia, excuse me. I'd like you to meet Helen, my wife. <laughs> Naturally, I came down at once. What would you expect me to do? I suppose you've seen this newspaper story. Seen it? I practically wrote it. Well, Julia, you've got nothing to worry about. I figured it all out on the way down. In spite of that picture, they can't prove a thing. You had a perfect right to be in the store at night, and so did Edwards. Besides that, all we need is a character witness and a dozen other people. Outstanding citizens who will testify for Julia Scott. Testify that her name has always stood for the very highest type of American womanhood. And then, when you get that on the stand yourself, why, Julia, I tell you, together we can beat this thing. You just leave it to me. Richard, you mean you really want to see me through this case that you honestly care enough to... See you through? Why, of course I'll oh. see you through. Do you expect me to sit idly by while the lending name is dragged in the mud? Oh, the lending name. So that's it. Then it's not me you want to defend. You don't care whether Mrs. Edwards' charges are true or not. You probably think they are. Well, if you can give me satisfactory proof that... Uh... I can't and I won't. Just bring on that trial. I'll take care of the Lenning name. How oh, oh, I'll take care of it. I can see myself on the stand right now. I'll make a speech like you've never heard. Julia. Your honor and gentlemen of the jury, it seems that I am on trial here. Well, I was in that store window that night because Jerry Edwards is about the sweetest man I know. And my husband, Richard Lenning, is the dullest. Our marriage was one of convenience, Your Honor. He wanted to hang on to a partner. And I, well, I only loved him like a fool from the first minute I ever looked at him. I hoped he'd find us something human. A man who didn't care whether I was efficient or not. A man who liked me, loved me as a woman. But what does Mr. Lenning propose? That I go back to being Julia Scott? That I give up all hope of ever really living and die by degrees as a servant of Richard Lenning? Gentlemen, I propose we try Mr. Lenning in this court. The case is obvious. The sentence? 
that he be married to his store and locked up in it for the rest of his life. Nobody would ever miss him. <laughs> That's Jerry Edwards. It'll make a perfect thing, period. Hello? Hello, Jerry. <laughs> that? But that, Jerry, was the dropping of a curtain. <laughs> Miss Annabelle, it's no use, I tell you. Your father's been in there for hours, and he won't see anybody. Yeah, well, he's going to see me, because I've got to see him. Now, you let me by. No, 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 now, you yes, mustn't. Now, now, you I'm wait. Miss, 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 Miss Annabelle, you, you, you can't. Daddy. I'm sorry, sir. I, I told her. Go away, Annabelle. I won't. I want to talk to you about Julia. Oh, I know why you've got yourself all locked up in here. Oh, Annabelle, this is none of your affair. It is my affair. I love Julia, and I want her back. I read that old paper, and whatever they said she did, she didn't do it. And you can believe she did if you're an old stoop enough, but she didn't. Annabelle. Oh, don't get mad, Daddy, but you're awful dumb about some things. Well, suppose I knew that now. I suppose Julia didn't want to come back. Well, gosh, can't you go and get her? Didn't you ever read about knights or nothing? They didn't wait for someone they loved to say yes or no. They just went out and dragged them in by the hair of the head. Annabelle, every one of the thousand spankings you deserve but didn't get is canceled. Franklin? Yes, sir? Get the car. We're going to Philadelphia. Begging your pardon, sir, but... But but, but you're going terribly fast. <laughs> Mr. Lenny! Dick, Frank. Just Dick to you. And I think I need another drink. Oh, yes. Yes, she's gone, Mr. Lenny. Gone? No, she left this afternoon with Mr. Edwards. For New York, I think. Come on, Frank. We're going back to New York. Oh, but while you're here, sir, there's a matter about the toy department. Toy I'd department? Like... My friend, you can take the toy department and ship it back to Santa Claus. Come on, Frank. You sure she wasn't here in the store in the last two hours? Oh, oh, no, sir. I ain't seen hide nor hair of her, Mr. Lenning. Frank, that settles it. We go home for one last look, and if she's not there, we'll call on the cops. Right you are, Dick, my boy. Uh -huh. Every cop on the force. Whee! Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Frank, what would you say those bricks were here on the sidewalk for? Why, I, I would say for the new addition to your store there. Ah, uh, but you're wrong. You're wrong. Here, Frank, how's your aim? <laughs> Oh, Mr. Lenning, your old store window. Oh, go on now, throw one. Have a window on me. Well, sir, if you insist... <laughs> Strike three! What a he, what a name. Well, I guess that's hurling the old tomato, sir. Now, Frank, now, now, what did you do that for? You know it was my turn. But I, I didn't hurl it, sir. Well, I didn't either. There, there must be... Oh, look, sir, there... Over there by that taxi cab. It, it, it's a womb. Oh, a softballer, hey? Hey, you! What do you mean by pitching without my okay? Come back here. You let me go. Ooh, Julia, Ju I've been looking for you. Take your hands off of me. Go ahead, driver. Okay. No, no, you don't. Get out of that cab, Julia Scott. I won't. Get out of that toot sweet or I'll tear out the door off. You and what live man? Hey, hey, lay off the door. Lay off the door. Thought I was fooling, eh? Now get out here. Well, uh, you're busting me door away. It's ruined. It's ruined. Franklin, buy this guy a new cab. Right, sir. Now, Mrs. Julia Scott Lenning, just where do you think you're going? I'm on my way to Pier Number 34. Come along and wish me bon voyage. Oh, you're going with that sap Edwards, huh? That's none of your business. No, come here. Let go of Not me. Not a chance. I've got the law on my side. Oh, you Yes, have... I have, and all the laws that were never written. Kiss me. Oh, Richard. Yeah. Thought that guy Edward was something, didn't you? Well, you're wrong. You're in the arms of the head pumpkins right now, Sir Richard. The guy who drags him home by the hair of the head. Now, how do you like it? Well, I... I, I don't know yet, but I think... Oh, Richard. Now, do I drag you or will you come willingly? Willingly, darling. Very willingly. Oh, Julia. Look, Richard, there's... There's still two bricks left, darling. Yep, one for you and one for me. Ready? Go!
I think we can predict a lasting peace in the Lenning household. But I'm still not sure who's going to be boss. Let's ask Ginger Rogers and George Brent. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. How's that for a new way of putting it, George? Well, it's about as new as all's well as that ends well, or it isn't the heat, it's the humidity. <laughs> George, if you're referring to the past week, I think this time it really was the heat. It certainly wasn't the humidity that made our thermometer boil over. You know, last week the asphalt in our tennis court was so hot that I fried a couple, a couple of eggs. couple of eggs. No, not eggs. <laughs> onions. Onions? Why onions, Ginger? I don't like eggs. Say, look at that tan George has got. What happened to you? Well, you know, the sun was terribly hot last week, and I just tipped my hat to a lady, and now look at me. <laughs> <laughs> a martyr to etiquette. How does a producer behave on a hot day, C.B.? Well, he, he goes for a swim if he has the time. I was in the pool every morning before breakfast. Oh, a bathtub scene, huh? <laughs> the mill touch to a heat wave. And a bathtub scene ought to include a certain kind of lather, shouldn't it, C.B.? Well, what kind do you suggest, Ginger? I should say Lux. And I can say other things about Lux, too. It's gentle and safe. It's economical, too. I always recommend it because I've used it for so long, and I know exactly how good it is. And let me forget all about the weather. <laughs> Let's put the heat on, Mr. DeMille, and find out what the lights in the front of the theater will spell next week. Yes, what is the bill, C.B.? Next Monday night, we're going to do You Can't Take It With You. A Pulitzer Prize play and a hit picture. It's a truly American comedy. And our stars will be Edward Arnold... Walter Connolly, Faye Ray, and Robert Cummings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't take it with you, starring Edward Arnold, Robert Connolly, Faye Ray, and Robert Cummings. That sounds like a double-A production. I'll certainly be on the receiving end of this microphone next Monday. Yeah, and I'm going to listen for some nice, cool spot like the desert. <laughs> Good night, C.B. <Stevie>. Goodbye. <laughs> Good night. Uh, you, you both earned the place in the sun tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward Arnold, Walter Connolly, Faye Ray, and Robert Cummings in You Can't Take It With You. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Melville Roy asking you to be sure to listen to the Lux Daytime program, The Life and Love of Dr. Susan. This human and gripping story of a young, attractive woman doctor is brought to you every afternoon, Monday through Friday. For the time and station, see your newspaper. The Life and Love of Dr. Susan comes to you in addition to the Lux Radio Theater. Heard in tonight's play were Frederick Mackay as Jerry Edwards, Marion Free as Gertrude Lenning, Doreen Tuttle as Martha Pryor, Vanjie Bealby as Miss Fitzpatrick, Margaret Brayton as Agnes, Lou Merrill as Hoyt, John Lake as Russell, Kay Sutton as Marie, Galen Galt as Franklin, Jesse Houston as Teacher, Dick Ryan as Watchman, James Eagles as Carter, and Ross Forrester as Taxi Driver. George Brent appears by arrangement with Warner Brothers, where he will soon start work in the Fighting 69th. Edith Fellows joined our cast through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures Corporation. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox, where he directed music for Hollywood Cavalcade. Our Lux Radio Theater production of She Married Her Boss has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the beauty care that nine out of ten Hollywood stars use to help keep their complexions beautifully clear and smooth. Flawless, as every woman wants her skin to be. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>